On this week's Dream Deals, we'll be taking a drive in the very rare and unusual Lotus Europa. Plus, if you're fed up with all the modern Euro boxes, we'll be giving you advice about buying your very own kit car. But first, it's time to put Lotus's second generation Elise through its paces. When car historians look back at the cult cars of the 1990s, I'll bet that the cars that are remembered most won't be the 200 miles per hour plus supercars or even the ludicrously fast rally inspired Japanese four wheel drives. No, the 90s marked the return of the humble sports car. Lotus launched their first car back in 1948. Some 48 years later, Lotus needed another model to back up flagging sales of their capable but ultimately outdated and expensive Esprit. They came up with this, the gorgeous Elise, a back to basic sports car, affordable, focused around the drive. It was a car that took Lotus back to its roots. The original Elise was launched back in 1996, an instant cult car. At the end of 2000, Lotus revealed this, the second generation Elise, with far more aggressive styling, lower ride height and a meaner, more menacing look. The car is powered by this 1.8 litre K-Series Rover engine producing 120 brake horsepower. Not much you may think, but when you consider the whole package weighs in at just under 700 kilograms, it means that the car's power to weight ratio is on a par with much faster and much more expensive machinery. 0 to 60 comes up in 5.5 seconds and it goes on to a top whack of 125 miles per hour. The key to the Elise's lightweight is the chassis and body parts. The chassis is made almost entirely from aluminium and is epoxy bonded or glued for lightness. The body panels are composite, which not only means your Elise is trim, but also very strong. At launch, the Elise was a huge success. Used examples commanded a higher price than list, and critics heralded a Lotus worthy of being described as the spiritual successor to the Classic 7. Praise indeed. So the original Elise led the way in terms of handling, but can the new one hang on to that crown? Find out at the end of the show when I'll be putting the new Elise through its paces. But if the new Elise is still a little bit too soft for you, why not try one of these? It's the XE's based on the old Elise and it is wild. What you get is a road going replica of the old Elise race car. So it looks like a race car, it sounds like a race car, and it goes like a race car. Obviously the numero uno dominating feature when you're driving the XE is the engine. Mostly because it's in here with you, sitting on your left shoulder like a para. It's loud, raucous and very hot. You physically feel its presence in the heat it gives off. Mind you, one good point for comfort, we've got a hard top. Cozy. Peer through the Ferrari 360-style Perspex cover over the engine and you'll see the same Rover K-Series 1.8-litre engine used in the Lotus 340R. In this particular trim, it'll develop 177 brake horsepower, dash from 0 to 60 in about 4.7 seconds, thank you very much, and onto a top speed of 136. That should do nicely, sir. The rear wing isn't just to look pretty, which I'm not sure if it even does, but it does give you additional downfalls at the back, and there's front skirting to give the same effect. And overall, OK, so the shape is based on the older lease. This is not a soppy looking car. It's much more purposeful and aggressive looking. This has serious presence on road or track. Unlike the Elise, the back end of which will step out quite quickly if you lift off the throttle on the way into a bend, in the XE it's set up rather differently. It just grips and grips and grips right up to the limit. Invincible you might think, but no. In fact this car really is set up much more like a proper race car for proper grown up race drivers, not idiots like me. But being a race car obviously does not mean it doesn't handle. It does right up to the limit. It is fantastic. You just need a bit of space to practice because every now and again you'll get it into such a tangle that even a really talented driver couldn't pull it out. That's my excuse. Oops. As a road car, in fact, the £10,000 premium over the standard of Lee's is hard to justify. But it is ultimately a toy for petrol heads. And if Brands Hatch or Silverstone track days feature in your diary, then this is the car to have. It's 
been great in recent years to see the resurgence of interest in two-seater sports cars. But whereas some of the big major manufacturers mess about making sure there's luggage space and they're comfy enough on long journeys to accommodate Aunt Agatha's piles, it's really good to see Lotus still making proper, no compromises sports cars. Sure, if you go for the Elise, there is enough room on board for a spare change of underwear. If you go for the Exige, there isn't even that. Ironic, really, because this is the car where you're likely to need it. It is a serious tool for driving fast. If you are lucky enough to be considering buying either of these, all I can say is you are going to need a very big toy box to accommodate your new toy. If either was mine, I don't think I'd ever put it away, ever. During the early 1960s, mid-mounted engines had become the norm for racing cars. For any sports car manufacturer, the logical next step would be to transfer this technology into its road-going models. And this is exactly what Lotus did with the Europa. Launched in 1966, the Europa was to be Colin Chapman's Lotus for Europe. The aim? To take on Porsche and Ferrari in their own backyard, and win. The car was to offer all the excitement and performance of a race car, but at a fraction of the price. But with its unusual styling, what is it that people find so alluring about the car? In fact, it's so unusual. It was one of the first mid-engine cars that was produced in any numbers. And it was so radically different from everything else that was on the roads at the time. So you got the handling, you got some of the performance, but basically it was that difference that drew me to it. Nothing like it. At launch, the Europa was powered by a 1.5 litre 75 brake horsepower engine supplied by Renault. Performance wasn't amazing with a top speed of only 115 miles an hour. But how does Steve find the car to drive? The actual acceleration is not staggering. I've taken people for rides in it who have not been impressed. It's quick enough, it's putting about 105 brake horsepower in a 650 kilogram car. But where it does excel is in with the road handling, with the engine stuck in the middle. And with everything being so low, with the centre of gravity being so low, actually going round bends is a wonderful experience. There's no deceleration, there's no changing the handling, it just goes round the bends. That's what makes it such an easy car to drive. Now Steve's Europa is a Series 2 and was available between 1969 and 1971. Like any cars of this age, there are bound to be problems, but has Steve found reliability to be good? Generally, yeah. It annoys me when people come up to me with this, oh, Lotus, lots of trouble, usually serious. That isn't the case. I imagine when Lotus were first putting out a lot of kit cars, it became an issue, simply because they were being put together in garages and maybe not being maintained as well as they should be. As long as as with any car, as long as it's well maintained, as long as it's looked after, then reliability isn't a concern. It's never let me down. Now with most classic sports cars, there is the fear of playing mechanic. Steve, however, has done a little more than most would even dare consider. But how much work has Steve actually done? All of it. Um, I had the car in, I bought the car in 1979. But then at the end of the, the late 80s, I decided it was getting a bit rough around the edges, so took it off the road and did a full restoration, put a new chassis on it. And uh, basically the philosophy of, I'm gonna have a go at doing everything myself. So it's down to the upholstery, the spraying, uh, obviously not the re-chroming, and I had the wheels refurbished, but apart from that, I'm happy to say it's all my own work and still get, continue to maintain it to this day. Lotus have got a really good network. There are various classic cars here. There's the local one that I'm lucky enough is Paul Matty, which is in Bromsgrove. Very easy. He's, they can get hold of most of the parts. Inevitably, there's going to be some parts that you can't get hold of. But again, there's, there are specialists throughout the country who either remanufacture parts or have got old parts, of, old part stocks in. I haven't been caught out yet, although it's been close a couple of times.
Production of the Europa ran for nine years, ending in 1975. Over 9,000 Europas were produced. Now resigned to the history books, the Europa will always be remembered as one of the most unusual and distinctive cars of its time. If someone said, here's a kit car, go and build it, you'd probably think of those small models you used to try and build as a child, only to find out halfway that you'd stuck the exhaust where the steering column should go. Well, if you thought that, you would be wrong, because on this week's Dream Deals, we're going to give you advice on buying your very own life-size kit car. I think the people in Ecton, they like to uh, really the childhood, I suppose. Um, it's like a drowned to the car now, um, they get to do it, and at the end of it, they can stand back and say, well, I've done that. That's really pleased. It's definitely the hobby industry. It's people who remember old cars, and they like the classic lines of it, or it's modern people who like the high performance that we offer. What is the appeal of building your own car? I've been riding motorcycles now for the last sort of 10 years and I've always done my own mechanics to them and that. Um, and it just seemed natural progression to want to build my own kit car. So I've got friends, lots of friends in Cambridge that have built kit cars and it just seemed natural to want to do one. The chance for people to build their own cars, understand the whole process of building a car and enjoying the driving experience. It's back to basics driving, the handling is better, the wind in your hair, it's it's, you know, proper driving but with modern equipment. Some people out there may be thinking, it's a kit, it's not as well built as my BMW or Mercedes. Well, just wait a minute, is your BMW or Merc hand built? No, I didn't think so. Just think of all those Aston Martin or Bentley owners who crow on about their car being hand built by the finest in the land. Well, the same applies with a kit, because you can either buy the kit as a pack or as a fully built handcrafted model. But should you decide to build it on your own, what equipment do you need? You need a good set of uh, spanners, um, King Dick or such like, um, a good set of files um, and a bit of nano. You need a basic set of tools, you can hire or borrow any more you need, but you know, it, it, it really is, they are really quite easy. You've got to be dedicated and you've got to want to build one, yeah. Prices for kits vary a great deal depending upon what model you buy and what stage of production it's at. For example, a semi-built model could cost around six thousand, while the same fully built would cost twelve and a half thousand pounds. So, how does the difference in price affect sales? The kit's still more popular due to the fact it's cheaper, or mainly cheaper for people to build their own car. But it's also the enjoyment of building their own car. The difference is not as much as most people think. Probably two identical cars, one built at home, one built by us, is probably fifteen hundred pounds difference between the two. One of the questions most commonly asked is how long it would take to build a road-going car. The answer pretty much depends upon what kit you buy. Obviously, the simpler the design, the quicker you should be able to finish. But perhaps more importantly is the amount of free time you have. Those with plenty will be out enjoying their car long before those who have to juggle life with their car. I think if uh, most people, you know, they take the time and uh, not afraid to ask questions, um, then yeah, it's quite easy. The most people have concerns about fitting body work. Uh, it's more a worry that they've got, you know, they just need some reassurance. After you've built your car, what about practicalities? All cars built at home have to go through a single vehicle approval, which is a test in itself, uh, to check the, the build quality and make sure that it meets all the emissions and noise regulations of, of the vehicle. Uh, we sometimes offer that as a pre-SVA check, just to make sure the car is, is SVA-able. But obviously once it's been SVA, then there should be no problem. SVA and MOT makes the car. It doesn't need a special insurance. There are special insurances about who offer very good rates for the, the type of performance car that we sell. The uh, majority of people use the specialist insurance because they are so much cheaper than your everyday insurance broker. Although the practicality of a kit car might be questionable, one thing is certain. In a world where car individuality is quickly disappearing, they offer the chance to relive what driving used to be about. OK, so they might not have heated seats or electric windows, but what they do offer is individuality, a back-to-basics driving experience and perhaps more importantly fun, something that many of today's manufacturers have forgotten about years ago. In 1976, Lotus launched its replacement for the Europa. Designed by the Italian stylehouse Cesaro, the S3 was initially powered by a 160 brake horsepower four-cylinder engine. 
with its motor racing links, it wasn't long before Lotus transferred its expertise to the Esprit. In 1980, Lotus fitted the car with a turbo, pushing power up to 210 brake horsepower. Top speed was 150, while the 0-60 dash could be reached in 6 seconds. In 1988, the Esprit was restyled. Out went the angular lines of the original to be replaced by curvier and sleeker lines of the new Peter Stevens design. Along with the body restyling came an increase in engine power and an overhaul of the car's interior. Prices for the Esprit obviously vary with age. An average price for a 1986 Turbo would be around £7,000, while a 1995 S4 will cost around £14,000. In 1997, the Esprit finally received the engine it had always deserved. Replacing the traditional four-cylinder was a 3.5-litre twin-turbo V8. Pumping out 350 brake horsepower, 60 comes up in just over 4 seconds and the car can go on to a top speed of 180 miles an hour. The Esprit was now firmly in supercar territory. Although the Esprit has been around for over 20 years, it still has that special something. OK, so the lines are becoming a little dated and perhaps it isn't as desirable as it once was. But one thing is guaranteed. No matter what the future holds for the Esprit, it will always be remembered as one of the all-time classic British sports cars. At the start of the show, we took a look at Lotus's Elise. Let's find out what it's like to drive. Now getting in the Elise was always quite tricky with its narrow doors and very low ride height and very wide door sills. But apparently on the updated car, Lotus have improved this to make it easier. Oh. <laughs> Could have I greased myself first. Without the roof, it's a lot easier. Lotus, for some reason, provided us with a left-hand drive car. Don't worry, it's also available in right-hand drive. And if you have any taste at all, you'll be glad to hear that there are other less garish colours available than this bright orange. Inside the cabin, it's still quite minimal with lots of exposed aluminium. Uh, the dials and switches are beautifully finished and the uh, Alcantara, the Alicanta, the man-made suede on the dashboard and the steering wheel is a very nice touch, makes the cabin feel very special. Nice one, Lotus. Tremendous car for going for a drive at the weekend for an hour and a half in. But it's 11 o'clock and it's a cold, wet night and you want a pint of milk. You're probably going to take anything but the Elise, let's face it. Now for 23 grand, what you don't get is air conditioning, electric windows, sun visors, ashtray, one of those little trays for your loose change, a pen holder. If you want all of that, you go and get yourself a Mondeo because at 23 grand, this car still represents fantastic value. The engine note is more befitting of a true sports car. Improved soundproofing has eliminated some of the mechanical thrash on the old car, and now it's got a much more befitting growl. Now, one thing we don't normally mention on this programme is fuel economy. However, with little weight, aerodynamic shape and a small 1.8 litre engine, the Elise returns impressive figures. A combined total of 38.5 miles per gallon should keep your Elise on the road and away from the petrol pump. 
The Elise was never intended as a practical everyday road car and the cabin space is, well, cosy and the luggage space is almost non-existent. But the car was always intended for driving thrills rather than shopping bills and it provides more of those smiles per mile that enthusiastic drivers will appreciate. Now at just under £23,000, the Elise represents, depending on your point of view, a great value sports car or a very expensive weekend toy. Now for those who can't bear to make those practicality sacrifices, there is of course always the MGF and the Mazda MX-5 and the BMW Z3. However, if you're prepared to make those sacrifices, the Elise will prove to be a much more rewarding car. It's always a daunting proposition for any car manufacturer to make a follow-up to one of their most successful models ever, especially when it's as loved as the Elise is. But this Elise continues the Lotus tradition and it's as rewarding and as exciting a drive as ever, even in orange. Next week on Dream Deals, it's an all-British affair as we take a look at the legend that is Aston Martin. We'll be putting the latest DB7 Vantage Volant through its paces and also giving you advice on how to get hold of your Aston Martin.